Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker, Sean Kendrick. Sean makes ruggedly handsome, hard-use tactical folders that exhibit a refined eye with a no-nonsense, purpose-driven utility. He works in a variety of materials, but when he puts a Damascus blade with a micarta handle, that's personally my favorite, because I find the warmth of that combination seems to set off a perfect contrast with his somewhat menacing designs. Sean is also a member of the Mark of the Makers podcast team, so doing this kind of thing isn't new or foreign to him. Now, I've been lusting after Sean's work on Instagram for a few years now, but only recently realized he was half of the recipe behind the ever so compelling Bad Blood folder designs that I loved back in the day. I also discovered that he lives and works in Ohio. So the next time I go home, I might have to doorstep him and check out what he's working on in his shop. But before I get rude and do that, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click on the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. If you think what we do here is valuable and want to help support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to do that is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Sean, welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Oh, man, I'm dandy. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Like I mentioned in that uh, somewhat flowery upfront uh, introduction, I've uh, I've been following your knives, watching you build them, and uh, kind of, I don't know, gauging your, your uh, body of work for the last couple of years. And then I find out, oh my gosh, Bad Blood. Uh, when Bad Blood came out, I was crazy about those designs and and I I see the through line um but the work that you put out from your own hands from your custom shop is just uh is beautiful and uh w- when I think a knife is beautiful it's because it has a a little bit of menace to it uh but a lot of uh I don't know spirit and heart how did you get into this I know you were a, a collector from an early age And it just kind of fell into my lap. I had always been into knives and, you know, I got married and was working and I happened upon a copy of Tactical Knives magazine and realized that there were people out there building knives just how they wanted them. And I've always been handy enough. And I said, well, you know what? I think I give that a go. And I did. And here we sit. Here we sit indeed. So uh, I was reading a little bio of you on uh, Arizona custom knives and you or they said that you had been collecting knives since you were seven. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I, well, that's when I officially got my first knife. There was a couple I worked here and there when I was younger than that, but they don't count. Right. Right. Well, how did, what's the story of your first knife? First one that you, you know, that you had for your own use. Yeah. Uh, uh well, just Dad knew I liked knives. I mean, I've always been into guns and knives. If it's weapons, I mean, it's just always been a part of who I am. That's what I dig. And when I got to seven, Dad figured that I was old enough for a fella to have his own pocket knife, and he got me a little three-blade Stockman Mini, and rest is history. Was that That's a case? A- oh, no, dude. It was some off-brand, you know, that you wouldn't mind giving to a kid who's probably right. going to treat it like shit and lose it. Right, right. Which is exactly what I did. So what did you use it for before you lost it? Oh, geez. What the fuck didn't I use it for, man? I mean, sticking in trees, cutting apples that didn't need cutting. I mean, any twine, any packages, any letters, whatever. <laughs> apples that don't need cutting. That sounds familiar. That That's kind of what I still use them for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you start making knives because, according to this uh, little article I read on you, uh, because... You saw a bunch of things that you wanted but couldn't afford. Or just couldn't get. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the way it goes. A guy gets popular. And shit, he gets five, six, seven years out on his book. And even if you can get on it, who knows if you'll ever see it. 
So what were those kind of, uh, what were those knives that you were interested in getting when you first started making knives? What were the ones that you were really chasing down, really going after? Uh, Emerson's, Mad Dogs. Uh, I was big into Microtex. Microtex was probably the first kind of pricey folder I ever bought. And just, you know, I, man, I liked all the tactical stuff. There wasn't too much I didn't like. Like, I'm really big into Crawford stuff. Uh, big into Alpokowski stuff. Oh, geez. Oh, so yeah. Alpokowski stuff, man. Dude's a I'm, fucking legend. Yeah, I met Al Polkowski at the New York uh, Custom Knife Show in the mm, late mid or late 90s. And um, I was I was happy to find out. He was kind of a – he was a uh, – uh, uh, I don't know. He kind of seemed like uh, what a knife maker at that point who made those like beautiful, beautifully carryable uh, double-edged fixed blade defensive knives. He was kind of, I don't want to say ornery. He was a great guy and he, he talked to me, but he didn't seem happy about it, you know? And, and that, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. seemed to fit the whole, the whole, um, the whole bill for me at the moment. I, I didn't know any knife makers at the time. But uh, yeah, to me, Al Polkowski, I actually recently was scouring the internet, trying to see if they're even gettable anymore. What'd you find, man? Did you find anything? No, I did not. I think the people who have them have kept them. And, you know, after, after someone passes away, after a while, things stop changing hands. And then you got to wait for, for some, you know, lucky shot at an estate sale or something like that. Yeah, it won't keep your eyes peeled to the purveyors. You never can tell what'll turn up on consignment. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's but, true. Dude, I would still, I mean, I would do nasty shit to get one of his Bob Casper collaboration designs. Yes. Like yeah. the pug or any of those. Oh, man, just quintessential fucking carryable fighting knives. Oh, yeah. And what's the one that they did, um, the two of them together? Uh, it was a design that they made that ended up... Um, CRKT licensed it and they made a, uh, a single edged version. Actually, it sits in my wife's office. I, that was the closest I ever got to getting one. Was that the scorpion? I think it was the scorpion. Yeah, it's got, and you know what? His knives were the first knives that I ever saw with a finger choil that sort of, um, sort of was like a, um, uh, sub hilt, you know, a finger yeah. choil that, kind of came beyond the handle and then dip back in and uh yeah uh, yeah and and that whole integral um finger guard thing and everything I, I loved it i loved it yeah dude what's well, not to lack i mean it's all aesthetically pleasing completely functional it hits on all cylinders yeah yeah and nice and thin and like you said mm -hmm. just easy to carry it i am a uh, i'm i'm a daily carrier of fixed blade knives I wear them in the waistband on my right hip, and um, lately I've been, you know, what it is, is summer when I'm when I'm walking around and it's easy to conceal, or winter when I'm walking around it's easy to conceal. But otherwise, I have an office job, so it's not it's not so easy to do all the time. And now I've been figuring out the most ideal knives for that kind of carry, and they happen to be slim, and they happen to be, you know, somewhat somewhat uh, small but all double-edged and all wicked because that's just kind of what I like. Well, yeah, I mean, why fuck around? Exactly, sir. Couldn't have said it better myself. So you start making knives. What are, what are, the, first, what are the first tactical knives or what are the first knives that you're making like? Man, uh, quasi-traditional. Uh, at the time, everybody's like, oh, if you're going to start out, do drop point hunters, do hunting knives and do pairing knives and stuff like that. So, you know, I was just following the paradigm and that's where I started out. And were you finding that they were, you know, easy to sell or, or how did, how did you start to figure like, man, I can actually sell these and then eventually make a living doing this? Man, I guess, let's see, about three or four years after I started making, I did my first knife show. It was the Let's see. Let's see what they were calling it at the time. I think it was the Greater Ohio Valley Knife Show. And I went to it and I took like 15 knives and I sold well over half of them, which surprised me. I was, you know, worried like hell I wasn't going to sell anything. Selling over half, I considered that a huge victory. And I was like, yeah. you know, hey, maybe this is a doable thing. Let's see how it shakes out. Let's keep running with this ball. So these are traditional knives. These are um, 
you said drop point hunters and those kind of things. Were well, you now they had a tactical lean to them? I mean, you know, there was okay. Micarta and G10, everything was full tank construction. I wasn't okay. doing soldered guards or anything like that. Right, right. Actually, that's what I was gonna ask you. Were you were you stacking leather and doing rat <laughs> tail? And, so these are all um were these all stock removal knives at this yeah. point? Yeah, that dude, that's all I've ever done. That's all I intend to do. Uh so uh, okay, so you go there and you start selling these kind of, you know, traditional with a with a bit of tactical uh, a feel to them knives. You sell half of them at this uh, Greater Ohio, uh, Ohio Valley Knife Show. You come back. When did you start thinking, or what was the um, what was the uh, sort of evolution of your thinking and your making, where you're like, uh, where you kind of shifted into, I mean, because your knives now, and and especially uh, some of the um, Fixed blade knives you're making, you know, 10, 8, 5 years ago are very fighter, you know, very tactical. Oh, yeah. and so, thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, there's one in particular uh, that was a chisel edge, double edge um, fighter with a thumb ramp and a nice uh, finger choil that uh, looks like it's probably like a six or seven inch blade that I kept coming across in some of the archives. Um, cause they're all sold off, but you can, you can go back far on Arizona custom knives and see older, older things. And those were really, uh, those were really fine looking fighting knives. So how did you make that jump? Like what were, what was your thinking? And, and you know, I just got co confident in myself, confident in my own design aesthetic and started making what I wanted to make. I stopped listening to people saying, oh, well, you know, this is how it's done. And this is like, there's fucking dance footprints on the floor and I need to follow those footprints. Once mm. I, you know, started doing my own thing and eschewing the dogma, that's when things really started to improve and started, you know, really developing my own style. Well, I think, uh, you know, there's a huge, you know, the knife world has gotten pretty big uh, yeah. and there are a lot of knife makers and a lot of uh, knife enthusiasts and uh, a number of them have channels on YouTube and I, I love them all. I mean, you know, some more than others, but I love that they exist, you know, and, and, yeah. um, but many of them, uh, most of them take the approach that, uh, and this is kind of probably true for most people. A knife is a tool. I don't look at it as a weapon. Um, and, and they kind of view knives uh, through that prism. And I totally respect that. Uh, I myself, um, really, to be totally honest, don't have much of a need for knives in my daily life. Of course, I find needs for them and uh, and I and I use them in that respect. So if I'm going to choose what prism I'm going to look at this collecting hobby or this this love through, to me, it's through weapons because that's what I've always been interested in. I've done martial arts that from the Philippines that are, that are blade based. And, uh, and, uh, I love the military history and the, and the history of combatives and stuff like that. So that's kind of always been, uh, the, the prism I, I view knives through. Um, so I'm glad to see, uh, you know, when people are openly embrace that instead of just, I just make tools. No, dude, I make stuff for fucking people. Or I used to make stuff for fucking people up. It seems like anymore now I make, you know, high end accessories for gentlemen sometimes. But <laughs> at one point in time, man, I was making badass knives for some of the baddest motherfuckers to walk the face of this planet. So uh, were those who were those customers? Did you have soldiers? Did you have military guys or just, uh, you know, who were you, who were your customer? Who was your customer back in those days? Man, it started out with military guys, but then it shifted over to private military contractors. And there were several years where probably 80 to 85 percent of my stuff was going to private military contractor guys. Right. And they don't get paid to be uh, to be nice. <laughs> so those no, those are the kind the guys of, I was dealing with. No. Those those are the kind of tools they need. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you mentioned now that uh, you feel like some of the stuff you're making now is high end. What did you call it? Pocket jewelry for gentlemen yeah. or something? Yeah. Uh, obviously, it is, but it isn't. So no, no. I mean, at the heart of it, man, I start out with okay. You got to have a folder that you can get into action quick. It's got to cut well and it's got to be carryable. And I mean, 
you cover those bases. That's your first thing. Anything after that, it's just icing on the cake. Right. So describe to me the evolution from, uh, or, you know, there must have been some need to go from the, the combat, the, the combat oriented fighting knives you were making to a more pocketable, to a more daily uh, carry kind of thing. Um, describe the, the evolution, how that happened. Yeah, man, not a lot of evolution to it. Uh, my buddy Dave Mosier, Dave and I had met at Blade Show and we'd known each other for years. And one day we were talking on the phone and he is just like, hey, man, you make a great fixed blade, but you're going to get left behind if you don't start making folders. Why don't you come out here? I'll show you what I know about folders. We'll get you making folders. Uh, it seemed logical to me. And I've always liked folding knives. I had tried to make them a few times, a few years before that. No real success. I mean, I made uh, four or five, maybe six that I thought were sellable and threw away. Fuck. Man, I don't even know how many. Uh, probably at least four or five times that. Mm. And so having Dave tell me, hey, let me show you how I do it. Because I, I was aware of his folders. I'd played with them before. I liked what he was doing. And I said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Hell yeah. So the two of you have a, a history of collaborating and actually um, your styles are different, but they really complement one another. Uh, you know, when you, when you design a knife together, it seems to work really well. Uh, well, thanks, man. And to be honest with you, it's really crazy simple whenever Dave and I design anything together. One of us will usually get an idea in their head. They'll get an initial drawing down. We'll send it to the other guy. He's going to put his stank on it. And generally, that's enough. Very few times that we had to really tweak too much to get it just where we wanted it. And we've always been pretty, well, we were always pretty copacetic like that. So he has some of the same um, goals with his designs as you? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when it comes to the final form and function, we're both coming from a similar headspace, definitely. So, uh, in, in looking at your knives, um, uh, I've noticed recently, um, I don't know recently, uh, but yeah, I guess somewhat recently, this really cool thing happening with the front end of your blades, with the tip of your blades, uh, they, you've got, um, uh, especially on the, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Yes. Okay. If you stop right there, Jim, like the one on the, now it's on the top and on the right, you see the, that little bevel on the edge of the tip there. I have yeah, my I, I have my ideas, but tell me what what how that came about, uh, man. Okay, here's the way that came about. I use Exacto knives a lot out in the shop, mm -hmm. and the point on those things is so fine that you know I use it once or twice, and that point gets busted off. Well, I started. I hate to throw the damn thing away because there's still a bunch of usable blade there. So I started grinding off the broken part until I got to a clean edge part. And after I would grind off the broken part, it didn't break again. I could hmm. keep using it and using it and using it until the goddamn thing was round as the edge of a penny. And it just kept taking it. So I was like, you know what? I think I can transition this over to an actual real folded knife. And I mean, if I showed you a picture of the exacto knives out in the shop, you'd be like, yeah, that's totally where that came from. Yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like it'd be great on a sort of pull cut or so the, the sort of cut you do on a, on a mat when you're cutting through something um, like a pull cut or whatever you call it, dragon cut. But also it seems like uh, reinforced, like you could still punch it through something pretty heavy oh, because, completely. because you have like a triangle basically at the very, at the yeah, very oh, front. Dude, it's a perfect diamond. If you look at it in cross sec, well, I mean, it should be a perfect diamond if I don't fuck it up and have to throw it away. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's inherently strong. You're taking away the weak, weakest part in the chain. So do you find that that's kind of how um, different design innovations in, in your line of work kind of kind of come about for you just through, um, I mean, it sounds like a eureka moment, basically. You know, you're doing something, you use your exacto knives in a certain way all the time, and then suddenly you realize, hey, this is scalable, this translates. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, so much of it's just been luck, you know? And 
having something basically fall in your lap. You don't, you weren't thinking about it. That wasn't the original intent, but Hey, here we go. Yeah. So how did you, um, how did you, what did you, when you first started doing folders, um, and we're not talking, uh, the traditional ones, but when you first started doing tactical folders, uh, were you doing liner locks or did you go, jump right into titanium frame locks? Frame locks, frame locks straight up. And as far as liner locks go, I think since I've started working with Dave, I have done four, maybe five liner locks and everything else has been frame lock. And that's just what works for me with the way I set a detent, the way I set a lock, the way I want a knife to walk and talk, frame locks just work better for me personally. So do you have a set, uh, like a setup, um, how to describe like a set geometry that you, that you build your knife around or it is each knife a new discovery? Each model gets its own geometry. I've got certain parameters I work within, but you know, given blade lengths and how stuff has to ride within the handle, you got to tweak that a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. So what are your favorite materials to make these knives in? I know titanium on the, on the, on the lock side, but uh, like I mentioned up front, you got some really creamy looking uh, like um, uh, Westinghouse micarta. It looks like you have some, some really nice warm looking materials that you like to work with. And I just like, I like micarta. I like G10. I like carbon fiber. Uh, you know, th those are my big three, really. That's generally what I draw from. I've worked in other stuff, but those are the ones that make me happy. I understand those materials. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a sculpture thing, kind of. So when yeah. you when you uh, design a knife, what is that process like? Mm. Dude, I mean, do you sit be... down with paper and do all that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. I got you know graph paper and a good mechanical pencil and a compass and erasers and. A little under light in case I've got to do some over tracings to check stuff out. Yeah, everything starts out with pencil and paper, period. And then you have the drawing, you decide this is what I'm going to make. And then what does your process look like from there? Uh, I'll run some copies and cut them out, put them onto usually Kydex, or I've got some old Delrin plastic that's, you know, I didn't pay anything for it, so I don't mind wasting it. And I start doing plastic mock-ups to see how everything moves, how everything functions. And once I get it to where, okay, it's walking and talking, it's closing and opening where it should be in plastic, then I can start, you know, actually investing some material in it. Do you cut everything out by hand? Yeah, yeah. With uh, just cheap, shitty bandsaw, Harbor Freight. Well, I actually upgraded to a jet, but for, shit, 15 years it was run a Harbor Freight special for two years until it shits out and buy a new one. And so everything is, it's so interesting because I, I talked to like such a variety of people here, as I know you do on your show, which I want to find out more about too. But like I talked to so many people on this show and there's such a wide variety of how people get stuff done. Oh yeah. Ask 10 makers, you get 10 different answers. And uh, so Doing everything by hand obviously takes more time. Doing everything, and when I say by hand, I mean I'm, I am not saying that uh, you use um, more advanced machines that you're not doing it by hand. But there's a different um, different process there. And yeah. yeah. So, how long does it take you to make one of these beautiful pieces? Mm, man, if everything goes pretty well, uh, four eight hour days four, eight hour day. Okay. So like a, like a work week. So while, yeah, while, yeah. while mo okay. All right. And, uh, and then, so I know, I understand who your customer was for the fighting knives. What about for these? And do you consider these folders fighting knives? Yes. Yeah. At the heart, man, they're made to fuck somebody up. That's, I, I will always design around that. Can you use this to fight? Is it deployable? You know, it is the geometry such that it was really going to turn somebody into pulled pork, you know? Just slightly less delicious. Indeed. Well, long pork, man. Everybody's got different tastes. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, it's gotten dark. It's <laughs> gotten dark. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I, 
that I, I totally understand because that's like I told you, that's that's where my tastes lie with knives. I like I like those kind of uh, I like fighting knives, even if I'm not doing the fighting. Uh, but are you finding that your customer base has shifted? Is it more um, collectors, appreciators? Yeah, yeah, a little definitely. Bit more? Collectors, appreciators, definitely, definitely. So, uh, do you know if people carry these things defensively? Is anyone, in other words, like I can't imagine taking one of your knives uh, into combat? You know, when th where things get lost and jacked up and all that. Uh, now, man. Now, when I was made, see, I sent a lot of folders overseas. I know those got carried for what they were intended for. And now, man, I'm sure some of these guys have to be carrying them as their defensive folder. They, right. I mean, law of averages being what it is, at least right. a couple of them have to. Right. Well, um, so we were talking about uh, David Mosier. And in, in the beginning, uh, I mentioned the bad blood knives, which were so cool to me and I never had one. I never got one. And then they seemed to, um, uh, I don't know, maybe I think they were, were they bought by, uh, the brand was bought by another company or something. I don't know. I, they seemed to disappear from prominence, uh, at least the places I was looking or who knows, maybe I moved on. I don't remember what it was. Not man, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure what all happened there because there were several other brands under the umbrella. It was a Hallmark cutlery and then oh, they man. had sub sub brands under that. And the bad blood stuff was doing pretty well, but I don't think the rest of the brands were doing quite as well. Not enough for the bad blood line to carry all the others. Right, right. So those knives were really cool. There were a number of uh, designs there that, um, I mean, now you can you can kind of see their DNA it carried on later in both your work and in David's custom work, which I'm a little less familiar with, but I, I did a little looking up of, of his work too. And, uh, you can see, I mean, those knives were, I mean, aside from the name and the big skull, on the, <laughs> on the blade, you could tell what those things were made for and with the recurves and, and, and all that. Oh, absolutely. Truth in advertising, man. Yeah. Were they all your designs, yours and David's designs, the bad blood, or did they have uh, other? Now they had some stuff that they would pick up with the black bad blood logo that was, you know, designed by some dude at the manufacturing company, okay. but there were just a handful of those and those got phased out once. See, it started out with me when my stuff did good. I was like, Hey, my stuff's doing well. You guys might want to take a look at some of Dave's designs because they would probably hit on the same cylinders and hopefully do equally well. And they did. Nice. So um, collaborations, obviously you're comfortable collaborating with David Mosier, um, but what about with other makers and what about with other production companies? Yeah, man. I, now other makers, I haven't worked with anybody. Let's see. I guess the last person I worked with was me and Michael Birch and I still mm -hmm. haven't finished one of those. I think he's done two and I've got parts for one sitting, but I haven't finished it yet. And I'm to the point where, you know, I don't want to waste nobody's time. And if I don't think I'm going to be able to finish it, I'm not going to hump your fucking leg. I'm just going to be like, hey, man, I would like to work with you, but I think it would probably be a waste of your time. If it ever gets to a point where I think that it would be mutually beneficial, then, yeah, we'll do it. But as it is now, man, yeah, I don't want to waste anybody's time. I know how slow I am. So it, it stands where it is. Now, as far as the production stuff goes, Man, I would be happy to work with another production company if they'd be willing to work with me. Michael Birch, that seems like a pretty good combination, the two of you. I mean, it just in terms of your design, design aesthetics and stuff, when you do, let's, let's say that collaboration in particular, do you design the handle? He designs the blade or you, you both have, um, you know, uh, input on both and then you put some together. He puts some together. How does that work? Man, Michael and I worked it pretty much the way Dave and I worked it. We kicked ideas around and Michael took the lead on actually drawing something out and he sent it to me and I changed a line here, changed a line there, and sent it back to him. And he said it was good. So we rolled with it. Uh, so recently, oh, okay, wait, actually, before I get to that, 
because I saw something else cool on your page. But um, so if you were to do something with uh, a, um, a production company, um, what I'm just curious, you say if they'd be willing to work with you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, man, I know what I'm worth. It depends on what they're offering me percentage wise on the back end. I mean, yeah. okay. you got to make it sweet for me. I'm not going to have you make all the fucking money and then pat me on the ass and send me back out. <laughs> make us another another one of your little knives. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, okay. I see what you mean. I thought you meant you're difficult to work with. But no, 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 dude, no, no. I'm not taking fucking three percent on the crut. That's yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, I, I got you. I got you. So uh recently I saw um uh a bally on your a bally song on your page. You were flipping one around and and I think maybe that was your first one in a while, or maybe your first one ever. First ever. Yep, first ever. ever. So uh what inspired you to make that and what was that process like? That was actually my final project for my machining degree that I got this year. Oh, congratulations. Oh, you're appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. It was fun. It was fun to be honest with you. I halfway wish I hadn't graduated because it was a lot of fun to go to class twice a week and get to play with other people's materials and equipment and not have to worry about it. Oh yeah. So we're, what, uh, what kind of machines were you learning on? Uh, Haas lathes, Haas mills, and then all kinds of manual tools. Oh, and well, let's see, did a little bit of wire EDM work. Uh, let's see. And I mean, it was just a complete machinist course. I got my associate's degree in computerized manufacturing. I also got my certifications as a CNC machinist and my certifications as a manual machinist. So you don't need to collaborate with a production company. You have all the skills to, you could, uh, technically make that happen through the skills you just learned basically oh, of course yeah. you'd, you'd have to buy all those machines of course and i'm sure that's yeah. no that's no mean no, feat that, but no that little bit of cash involved there yeah maybe just a touch uh what so what did you like better or i mean like what was your favorite because i hear a lot about cnc i hear a lot about wire edm and i have uh, i i i i understand um cnc like in as much as someone who is not a machinist at all uh, can but uh, wire EDM is really foreign to me, and it seems like kind of uh, like a little bit of alien technology there. <laughs> then at the heart of it, it's actually pretty simple. You're using an electrical spark to remove metal. It's hmm. that's the long and the short of it. You have a machine that's running a piece of usually brass wire that is about as thick as a human hair, maybe just a <sighs> maybe just a hair more. And it's using CNC to move it through the material. And as it goes through the material, it's in this water bath that's completely conductive. And it's just spark eroding away the metal. Wow. Yeah, it's a little light show underwater is what it looks like. That is gross. So the whole process happens underwater? Yeah, yeah. It's done in a tank that you get your part set up, you hit a button, the tank fills with water. Jeez. And that's how some of these... Uh, uh, real big um yeah high high end um uh oems do it right i mean they use those kind of machines man i don't know if they're using a wire edm or what we refer to as a sinker edm but they're definitely using edm to do a lot of the stuff they're doing as far as like you know how kershaw has the blades that the edge is a different material from the spine and it's interlocked yeah. together with dovetails yeah yeah you're n yeah you're going to edm that if you've got an edm yeah that's is that is that happen. because the tolerances have to be so yeah. so close and yes yeah if you want it to fit up proper if you want it to not have gaps and light showing through yeah that's the easiest way to do it wow that i mean to me that's a you know that's a that's an interesting i mean that's technology filling in the gaps it's sort of like yeah. uh you know, or the, an example I like to use is like if Rembrandt had a camera, he'd probably do that instead of going through the trouble of making an oil painting. You know, if he really wanted yeah. to represent something the way the way it looks. Um, so how do you how do you manage to get um, such tight tolerances in your work I, doing it by hand? I mean, I know that's how it was done originally and that we've kind of come to to uh, depend on some really high tech machinery to get things so refined. But for you, how, how have you managed to get things so refined? Uh, man, my shop is stupid low tech. 
Like I don't even have a digital readout on my meal, any of my meals, none of that. I mean, shit, I've got a digital readout that's a Cadillac sitting in a box because I'm too goddamn <laughs> lazy to install it. But a lot of it just comes down to, you know, really simple, really solid fixturing for the stuff that has to be spot on and just make sure you've got that down pat and you'll be good to go. Do you have a high, um, like, uh, what's the word? Is it not attrition rate, but do you, do you get rid of uh, a no, lot of what's yeah, that? attrition? Attrition would be fine. <laughs> not as much as I used to. Okay. Not as much as I used to. And really generally when I've got a, toss one it's because i fucked up grinding the master bells that's every now and again maybe i'll botch a lock knock on, <laughs> knock on wood but uh most of my problems come from freehand grinding because I'm, it's freehand you right. know so that doesn't mean you have to throw the whole thing away that's just a blade right just the blade yeah and i can have a new blade made up and in, in the heat treat oven usually in about three four hours so all of your grinding is freehand all, all uh, my, my swedge grinds, I use a fixture for because it's just easier for me to use a flat grinding fixture for those really short accent grinds. Mm -hmm. But for the way I want my master bevels to look, for the way I want the geometry to be, I haven't been able to find anything that even comes close to being able to replicate what I do with my hands. That's, that's great. And that also, to me, that also makes what you do more valuable it makes your product more valuable because and that's just to me but no, dude uh, it makes it more mine if it don't make it nothing else yeah yeah exactly exactly it's like a sculpture and you've had your hands on it you know I, that dude, it, I, I refer to what i do to when i'm trying to tell people what i do mm -hmm. a lot of what i do is actually very sculptural the way i do handle work 100 percent sculptural it's all done freehand and i'm moving it back and forth. I'm blending stuff as I go. And I mean, when you're grinding a hollow grind, once again, it's sculptural. To me, that's like the scariest part right there. Um, oh yeah. It sucks ass, man. man yeah, that's yeah. Just fucking <laughs> anxiety city. We're talking, you know, half a pack of smoke. So I'm grinding a blade. So what, what kind of steel do you like to work with best? Is, do you find that one is more forgiving or is, is there even such a thing when you're grinding steel? Uh, no. Given my druthers, I like to grind one CPM 154. It grinds a little easier. It finishes super, super nice. But my favorite steel in the world is 3V. And I mean by a fucking long shot. There isn't anything else that comes close to what it does. I mean, all knife steels are a compromise. And when they were looking at the compromises they were going to hit with 3V, it was like, is this a compromise Sean would make? Hmm. Let's ask him. So what about 3V is is uh, uh, so good? And I'll preface that by saying I have a couple of 3V knives. I just I just got one from a young a young maker and it, and uh, I ordered it and I have two other uh, I have a a bark river in 3v and I, I have one other knife i can't think of right now in 3v and i just kind of know it's good but why man the toughness to edge holding mm. you nothing else even comes close really i mean generally for a blade to hold an edge like 3v does you sacrifice a lot with toughness you sacrifice a lot with impact resistance mm. and 3v is just like fuck it beat me beat me <laughs> I mean, seriously, when I first started using it, one of my tests to see if I nailed my heat treat where I wanted it, get my grind done, put a quick sharpening job on it, hold it at shoulder height and drop it onto the concrete tip. Oh, it. God. And, what happened? Well, you get a little bit of concrete dust on your tip, but if, as long as I did my part right, there's a little ding out of the concrete and that was about it. Jeez, man, I should get every single knife I own out of 3V because down here in my in my basement, the concrete floor, me and blade tips, I'm constantly, <laughs> man, I should make everything three. So that's why they do, that's why 3V is seen a lot on outdoor camp knives and that kind of thing. Oh, dude, it's tough as a $2 steak, hell yeah. <laughs> I like that, tough as a $2 steak. I'm going to have to remember that and uh, I, I'm not going to credit you. I hope you don't mind. You ain't got to, man. I stole it from somebody else. Keep it going. <laughs> All right. 
So Mark of the Maker podcast, tell me a bit about, about working on that and uh, how you got involved in it and, and kind of what you see your role is on that show. <laughs> and I'm comedic relief. That's what the fuck I am on that show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, it's a passion of mine. I enjoy doing it. I believe in our mission statement, which is we're just trying to make the knife world a little better. We're trying to put good, solid information out there for people to take in. And we're trying to put some history out there because we need to know where we've been. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to know who the giants that we're standing on the shoulders of are. There's a lot of talk on that show of um, like technique and Maybe technique isn't the right word, but it it gets into the weeds with, with yeah, yeah, and uh, that that is something that uh, I remember the the first episode I listened to was all about stabilized wood. I think it was maybe yeah, we few, talked about it a few years back, and it was with a special guest, and and uh, and man, I, it got so granular, and and to me, I was like, this is this is a podcast for knife makers for sure. And uh, yeah, a, a valuable resource, you know, it's just like a podcast for anything that anything else that you do out there and you want to hear people talking about the specifics because on a show like this one, I just talk to the people whose work I admire. And, uh, you know, that's that's a it's a different way of it's from a collector's point of view or from a, uh, you know, someone who doesn't make knives point of view. And I feel like Ma Mark of the Maker really, really does something valuable. Uh, you know, for knife makers and real knife enthusiasts. Oh man, thank you. I mean, at, yeah. at our heart, we're all just four knife nerds, four huge knife nerds, and we enjoy sharing our passion with people. We enjoy, you know, putting that passion out there and seeing it bounce back at us by our listeners. Yeah, you've got a uh, you've got a rabid following for sure. Oh, dude, they're rock stars. That they have been really good to us and. I can't say enough about them. It's always nice meeting our listeners because, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're pretty cool motherfuckers. So have you, t uh, I know you were just at, uh, um, you were just at TKI. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so do you do um, knife, a lot of knife shows? And I'm sure you meet a lot of your listeners when you do those, when you go to the knife shows and such, but is that, is that part of your regular uh, marketing is that part of your regular like upkeep of business um how does the how does you handle the show thing and not like it used to be uh i'm to a point now a lot of folks know where i am i don't really need to be getting out there and trying to press the flesh and get a knife into everybody's hand like hey check this out at least i hope i'm to the point where my reputation precedes me a little bit mm -hmm. uh generally here anymore i'll do usually two shows a year where I actually set up as an exhibitor. Any other shows I go to, I'm going as an in attendee to cover it for the podcast potentially. Oh, cool. And, uh, and to just you, see cool knives, man. Cause I like fucking knife shows. Oh my God. Okay. So I'll, 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 uh, I just did, went to my first blade show this year and, um, it, it was, it was an experience that where I was like, I cannot believe that, that it took me this long to get my butt down here, man. Uh, I loved it. I loved it. And not only did I love, um, you know, I got to meet Ernest Emerson, who's a, who's a you know, long time hero of mine. I got to oh, meet dude, icon in the industry. And oh yeah. I put it mildly. And, and such a nice guy, you know, I've, I've yeah. talked to him on this show a couple of times and, um, well, I got a chance to meet so many people that I've spoken to like you and I are talking and to meet people in person it was really great because I feel like how often do you sit down and have an hour long conversation with someone you get to, you know, you get to, you get to have that experience and then you get to meet them. And it was amazing. I really enjoyed that. But another aspect of it that I couldn't believe, I mean, I was really blown away by was the scale yeah. of, of the table section. There's just acres of tables with passionate knife makers who have just incredible work that you've never heard of or, or that I hadn't heard of. And uh, it, it, it was such exposure to new makers that it was, man, it was awesome. It was awesome. There's nothing I love better than a big Bowie knife, you know? And I, I felt yeah. like, I felt like, man, I, I should have saved up more. 
Yeah. Well, man, just, you know, everybody's first blade show, when you first go through those double doors and you see the expanse of that room, there's that moment where there's trumpets and angels, and you know, you're where you need to fucking be in the yeah. world at that point in time. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. Like, I was like, there's nothing else that I could walk around, uh, you know, acres and acres of for 16 hours over two different days, you know, uh, on my feet for pretty much that entire time. There's nothing else that I could do uh, and not get sick of. But I was like, man, I just want to see more knives. And I know I missed that section of tables. And it really does take quite a while, man. I mean, yes. to see it all. To do it and no all. matter how thorough you think you've been, you miss somebody. Oh yeah, that's, oh. I mean that's just the nature of the beast. Yep, yep. And then and then you have that uh, this this horrible uh, nagging feeling inside at every at every place that you move along. You're like, yeah, I'll come back. And then you're like, well, <laughs> what? You know, <laughs> forgot about them. Don't yeah. don't remember where they were. What was that one with the with the choil that I liked? You know. Forget it. Or you get back and they're sold out and they've already broke their table down and they're nowhere to be seen. <laughs> yeah. And also, I mean, this is this is a whole other aspect of it. I kind of wish I had an extra day for are the people who are reselling old Randall maids and old Italian switchblades and and you know, just the acres of of uh old slip joints. You know, I love all knives. And uh, I, f I felt like while I was there, um, you know, I'm, I was way more focused on custom knife makers and, um, you know, people in the industry that I've already met. But there are resellers uh, and antique dealers there that, yeah, I missed out on because, you know, I love I love Randall's. I love Randall and made knives and they were all over the place. There is solid gold in some of them cases, but you got to pan for it. You got to look. You got to put in the legwork. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And we were talking before we started rolling here about glasses and the hassle with, with eyes. And it was like, one day I wore my contact lenses so I could have my, uh, my readers. And then the other day I wore my regular glasses so I could take them off. And I was like, I don't know the best way to look at these damn things. I need to walk around with a, with a, uh, you know, a monocle or something. Well, that's classy, dude. Shit. Ah, that is classy. Maybe well, that's a monocle. <laughs> Mr. Peanut wears one. Come on. <laughs> Exactly. Maybe that should be my thing. Ever. <laughs> Dude, get some spats and a cane, a monocle. Hell oh, yeah. Oh, You'll be yeah. pulling tail. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And, uh, you know, buying old classics there. So uh, do you I, do you still collect? Do you collect knives? Like oh, of absolutely. other makers? Yeah, yeah. I got a Dave Brown trench knife uh, oh. three or four months ago. Wow. So uh, tell me about your collection a little bit. Uh, man, it's all over the place. I mean, it's all, you know, very aggressive stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've got, let's see, I've actually let go of some stuff here and there over the years. I've got a few pieces left from the guy who mentored me, Mike Franklin, and some of his hog pieces. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've still got one Al Pukowski, the one Pukowski I was able to procure. Uh, Which model is that? Man, it's a little double-edged boot knife, and I don't know if he ever named it. Okay. That's cool. Got yeah, it's got like a three and a quarter inch double edge blade, black and gray G10 handles. I mean, it's straight Polkowski. You know what it is when you look at it, even if it don't have a logo on it. That's awesome. Oh, dude, it's a sweet little piece. God, I love that knife. Do you carry it? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've learned like at first when I first, uh, yeah, I don't have too many custom knives in my collection yet, but it's it's growing uh, definitely since I've started talking to people like like you and I'm like talking to people and I get very interested in their knives and um, that is growing. But at first it was like, oh, you know, I'll put it, set it on the shelf and and like make sure the lighting is right. And now now I realize now this person made this thing to be carried now. Yeah. You know, I, I have a I have like a I have a Greg Lightfoot knife that I really like. And um, to me, when I first got that, I'm like, uh, you know, yeah, I won't be carrying this. And now uh, I carry it sometimes. I just don't carry it because it's so giant. You know, it's like a it's yeah. a it's a big, thick brick, but it's a Pocket really sword. what's that? Pocket sword. Yeah, exactly. Pocket sword. I don't you know, it's it's more the thick, the width of it. It's just gotcha. like, holy mackerel. But uh, it's you know, I leave it out and about. I play with it. I, I use it when when it's appropriate. Um, 
yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't know how, how you continue on into old age if you're acquiring knives at the rate I am. Like, <laughs> what you do, where you put them. And, and now I'm getting into tomahawks, you know, like this one. <laughs> I got that one at Blade Show. And that's an Elmer Roosh. And he's like, he's the tomahawk man. And I've, I discovered, I didn't discover him, but I, I, well, no, sure. you personally discovered his work. Yes, exactly. I personally discovered his work and was like, oh, my God, this is a revelation to me. Oh, you dude, know? he makes sweet stuff. Like my oldest boy has one of his hammers that's oh. phenomenal. Just, I mean, it's a fucking hammer, but it's a work of art, period. He had these, he had a couple of those tomahawks. I'm really interested right now in the in the sort of uh, northeast woodland uh, you know, Indian Iroquois tomahawks. Uh, but Elmer Rouge had some sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, kind of like Viking axes and, and things that looked, you know, that, that, that were just variations and, and they all look so beautiful and they're all made in such, such, uh, authentic, authentic ways. Yeah. But, I, but it's still super clean work. It's not like, it's hard to put, let's see, how would I put it? It's, well, I mean, straight functional elegance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and light, this thing is light and, oh man, I just look at it. <laughs> oh, dude, I like that spike on it. Now I'm a big spike yeah. guy. Yeah. And that yeah. spike looks like business. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like he does this Embowler 3000 right there. <laughs> yeah. It's the through the, through the helmet sort of thing man um <laughs> disemboweler disemboweler 3000 uh one one last thing that that i'll uh, since i know you you like trench knives um you know les george has a fascination with trench knives yeah and uh say the least yeah <laughs> some would call it a fetish but <laughs> i'm not a judge <laughs> no, it's less i'll judge Oh my gosh. So I, I went to his table and he was like, uh, Oh, remember those? So he, he had a whole bunch of, uh, the, uh, 1917 knuckle, uh, knuckle duster handles, uh, cast. Yeah. A and he's done a couple of blades for them. And then he sent them out to a couple of people to have blades made. And, um, one of them was Matt Martin, uh, of vehement blades. And the other was, um, the other that I saw there, he had, he once he got to Blade Show, these two knife makers, and Alan Elishowitz was the other one, and they did their takes on the dagger blades, but mounted in those handles, and they kept one for themselves, and they gave one back to Les, and man, that was a cool project. Those things oh, yeah. are, those now, things. I are think so cool. Andrew Boydeman had a little bit to do with that. I think that that came about from where he was casting his Doughboy series of Nucks. Because the Doughboy Nucks oh. are basically a Nuck based on the 1918 trench handle. And I, oh, he had right. talked less about doing up some of those. And I think he sent him some cast handles and Les did blades for him. Although, I mean, Les has certainly done plenty of 1918 stuff on his own also. Right. No, 1918. What did I say? 17, I think. Uh, dude, it, it was probably getting worked on in 17. Yeah, right. Exactly. exactly. You know how those wheels grind slow. <laughs> those government wheels. Those government procurement wheels. They do grow. They do they do grind slowly. So, uh, speaking of grinding slowly, what are you thinking of? Uh, where Where do you see your stuff going? And what What are your latest models that you're most excited about? And And you know, what can we expect to see from you in the future? Man, well, more butterfly knives. I had a whole lot of fun doing the butterfly knife I did, so I definitely want to get back into that and do more of those because I've really, I mean, I've done one. I, you can't even say that's scratching the surface. Yeah. That's just getting your prototype out of the way to see where you need to improve and what you need to tweak. So I'm going to do more of those. And eventually I'm going to start doing even smaller knives. Uh, I've been trying to get a mini version of the hex done for like five years now. And I keep back burner in it, but eventually I'll get around to getting that guy knocked out. <clears throat> Man, really, I don't know who the hell knows. Every day is an adventure. When I step out the door, who knows where the breeze is going to blow me. So a uh, smaller version of the hex, are you finding demand for smaller and smaller knives or is this just something that you're interested in challenging yourself with? Both, both. Uh, I, with the clientele I'm selling to, 
you know, a lot of them, a smaller knife just makes more sense for their lifestyle. It makes more sense for, you know, if they're going to carry it to work or if they're going to carry it around town, smaller is better. So I'm trying to fill that niche. And then, man, I would just like to see one that's smaller for my own gratification. Uh, something I really like on your blades on the on the back, you frequently have a thumb swale that your thumb just looks like it could press into right on the back of the blade so yep. well. And uh, I, I feel like that is a feature that is scalable. And, and so you can make a knife comfortable. Obviously, the ones that you've been used to making at the size you're used to making them, obviously, that's way dialed in. But with that feature that is uh, so so much a part of your look, you know, so much yeah. a part of like a signature part of your style, um, in a way, it's a blessing when you're scaling it down because I feel like I feel like you can run into trouble when you're scaling something down, you know, to make it to make it fit and feel right. But with that feature on the back of the blade, it seems like that's just a really good thing to have there because it's going to make that knife uh, in a smaller version feel really good in hand and feel really usable. Yeah, man. Agreed. That's my take on it. I, I, I like thumb ramps. I use a saber grip a lot. You know, your thumb's going to get placed there. Mm -hmm. You should have some more secure and comfortable to place your thumb when you're doing that. Well, I'm not just talking about the ramp. I'm talking about the part forward to the ramp. Oh, okay. You know, where, where that little, down. yeah, the dip where you can, where you can put your thumb. And the funny part about that is I do that because I don't like having to polish straight spines and get the facets out of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the long and the short of it. Well, that's, you know, necessity being the mother of invention and inventing something really, you know, because to me, I love the way it looks. All right. To me, that's it's evocative of the Mac V SOG, you know, mm. with the dips and the and the but but also, uh, you know, I have a couple of knives uh, where it, there is a feature like that on the back. And just to sink my thumb in that area, I like to put my thumb on the back of the blade and just to have to have a place to put my thumb like that. I feel like that's a great thing for uh scaling it out now your leaf shaped blade obviously doesn't have that but that's a that's a whole other beauty man that oh, leaf you. shape yeah I, I i really like the way that looks and that's on the hex right uh, man i do the leaf shape on every model i make okay that remind yeah. me the the shape of that reminds me of a the barong you know that the leaf shaped yeah no, dude, that's exactly what i'm drawing from i mean i did oh. several barong inspired fixed blades and God. It worked super well, and I was like, you know, transfer this over to a folder. I love that. I love that. It's one of my favorite sword slash bolo type devices, and uh, you know, we don't see enough of that in in folding form. No, well, I mean, a lot. Of, if you don't look at it right, it can be a daunting task because you can get it in your head. Oh, but wrong. You know, it's got to have a fucking nine inch blade that's three and a half inches wide at the belly. Yeah, but you can scale that a little bit. Yeah, agreed. I think you did a great job with it. Thank on you. Your, yeah, my pleasure. So tell people how they can be a customer of yours. Tell people how they can. Um, are you? Do you have books? Do do you, do people just reach out to you? How does that work? Ordering, getting a knife from you. Man, any more? Uh, easy answer is if you see me setting up at a show, get in on the lotteries. Uh, keep your ears to the ground. See if I'm going to be at any get-togethers. If I do a get-together, I'll usually have a knife or two with me. And as far as getting like an order kind of Burger King your way right away, well, you're not going to get it right away. But if you want it your way, you're going to have to offer me money and you're going to have to make it real interesting for me because I can make what I want to make and sell it. So you got to sweeten the pot. That's a blessing right there. So, oh, hell yeah, dude. I live a charmed life. Holy shit. <laughs> Be able to feed my kids and do what I love. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So it's not just like, Hmm, I like this one on Instagram. I will buy this, sir. Those are all spoken for. Those are, those are going, they all, already have owners in mind. Ah, oh, that's so disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, generally if, if it's for a show, I'll put it up and say the show I'll have it at. If I don't put up any information besides that, you can guarantee that that knife's probably already shipped. It's to already it spoken for. for. Awesome. Well, Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your taking the time and talking with me. Uh, I've been digging your knives for longer than I knew I was digging your knives. You know, <laughs> like when I saw those bad bloods, I was like, damn, okay, someone's doing this right. 
And uh, so, uh, and and your your handmade, your custom work just. I, I look forward to the day I get my hands on one and check it out. Let me just put it that way. Oh, man, I hope it don't disappoint you. I doubt it will. I doubt it will, sir. So uh, thanks again. And uh, I hope to meet you in person sometime soon. Oh, absolutely, man. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. It's oh, been a damn my, good time. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. So I was recently uh, telling my daughters that there is no escaping hard work in this life. You're either going to get a job that you hate and you're going to and you're going to work that job and that's going to be hard work or you're going to work your butt off to to have your dream and to uh, live the charmed life like Sean was just saying um and and he just perfectly illustrated it to me, you know, you can't escape the hard work. So why not work hard at something that you will eventually uh, be able to do what you want, make what you want, and have people who want it, no matter what you're doing and in what line of work. So um, anyway, I don't know. That just it just occurred to me because I was just uh, finishing up a lecture before we started this podcast, and and he basically corroborated what I was saying to my daughters. So I'm so glad I got to meet him for another reason. Uh, check out Sean Kendrick's work. Uh, best place to do it, I think, is on Instagram because um, you just kind of get a, a, a feed of the beautiful stuff he's doing. It's also worth your time to go to custom uh, Arizona Custom Knives and a couple of other places uh, that you'll find when you Google to, to look at his back catalog, the things he's made you know, over the years. Uh, Arizona Custom Knives is great for that for all makers. They seem to never take down listings. They just get sold and pushed back on other pages. So definitely do that and check out Sean Kendrick's work. Also check out uh, the other interviews we do here every Sunday and also Thursday Night Knives, our very lively audience participation show here every Thursday night at 10 p.m. And then of course we have the Wednesday show where I just go on and on about my own knives. It's, uh, it's a little bit of self-indulgence. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.